Greetings, everyone. It's so great to be here with you. So, uh, Frauders and Sorors, I want to begin my slides and share with you some information about uh, the subject of soulmates. So I hope that you find the, the presentation interesting, whether or not you're um, interested in it or not. This is Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day. And I send love to all of you. Thank you again so much for being here. So the subtitle says, are they real? And that's the question of the day. We're going to actually address several questions and I'll be asking you a few of these. They're rhetorical, of course, so you don't need to answer them, but I do want you to think about them. You know that Valentine's Day can be emotionally challenging for folks who are searching for that significant other, either because they've experienced separation, divorce, or the transition or death of a loved one. And also um, just because it happens to be a day when that sort of theme is being emphasized. Everywhere you look, flower shops are selling flowers, chocolates, jewelry, advertising, and we are often overwhelmed with uh, something maybe we don't really want to hear too much about. And like many holidays, they are opportunities for um, commercialism which is something that kind of drives the Western world. And many of us will support that also by buying a little gift or a card for someone who's important to us. So let's have a look at the subjects we're going to treat today. First of all, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from the Rosicrucian teachings. And then we're going to define, especially through the popular conception, what a soulmate might be. What are the origins of the idea of soulmates? And then we are going to talk about some of the things that may matter to you. How do you know the difference between real love or just infatuation? Is it fate, chance, or choice? What is the soulmate myth? Then we'll look at some of the characteristics of the ideal soulmate. And perhaps we'll try to answer that question. Can soulmates be real? And finally, we will end with a meditation and visualizing your soulmate. So we were talking about the fact that it's an, an emotionally challenging day for some people. Other people really welcome it because they get a chance to share their love with someone important. So here are the topics as I listed them. And we will end, we'll have a little brief meditation during the presentation, but we'll also end with one about visualizing your soulmate. So thank you for your patience. So here are the quotes, and I'll just review them quickly because we still have people entering the webinar. Love is the supreme spiritual law. It is the essence of existence, a dynamic force in the universe, and the ultimate rule and guide in everything. Love is what informs us and our decisions, our choices. And there are various levels of love that we're going to talk about in the course of this presentation. Next, another important quotation from the higher degrees. The mind and consciousness of humanity are universal and we are never separated from universal consciousness and its essence, universal love. And from the Liber Lucas, if you're using the hard C from Latin, or as we might say in North America, Liber Lucius, which translates as the Book of Light. Throughout human history, peoples of different origins have perceived a connection with something ineffable. That is the source of the primordial light of the cosmos, compelling all life toward its highest expression and refinement, love. That is our highest expression or the highest expression of humanity. Ultimately, at the end of life, nothing else matters. So getting down to the nitty gritty here, and some people use the term twin flame synonymous with soulmate, although others would say, oh, they're not the same thing at all. They're quite different. 
but the idea of the twin flame implies unending passion and fascination. It also implies resonating on the same frequency of vibration with another person. This beautiful painting is from the Romantic tradition and it's entitled Springtime. It depicts Cupid or Eros and Psyche. And you'll see here that Psyche means mind, Eros meaning love. And usually the thinking is that it has to do with bodily love or that physical attraction that we have for someone. So Pierre Auguste Code is depicting the excitement of youth and the emblematic union, however, also of love and soul consciousness. So what is a soulmate? And here's the popular conception. The love of your life. A twin soul separated by time and space, but who has been with you through many lifetimes. A life's companion who completes you. The single most important person in your life. Someone who loves you for yourself, accepts your flaws, and stays with you regardless forever. Someone whose passion for and appreciation of you never fades, whose love and affection deepens over time. So here are two questions that arise when we think about soulmates. Does having a soulmate mean growing old together? What if one person is evolving and changing while the other stays somewhat static or fears change? Let's think about that soulmate list again, as someone who completes you, who adores you for yourself no matter what, who stays with you forever whose passion never fades. Well, what do you notice about that list? Aren't those definitions really about what you are receiving and not about what you have to offer in return? Life's gifts need to circulate. It's a natural law since giving and receiving, they're a reciprocal process. So if you want affection, give affection. If you wish respect, give respect. If you wish love, give genuine love and caring. Let's look at some of the origins of the soulmate mythology. In ancient Greek mythology, as reported by Plato in his dialogues, he speaks of the hermaphrodite, two persons in one body as the original man-woman. In this myth, the hermaphrodite was split into two beings, polar opposites, and each henceforth is in search of the other half. In alchemy, the rebis, the R-E-B-I-S, as depicted in the illustration, is a combination of energies, the ray or the raw, masculine, and the isis, or feminine energy. And we see them combined here in the illustration into one person. We also see several symbols that are important in alchemy. The sun relating to masculine energy, the moon to the feminine, and the six pointed star above, which really represents their combination and the birth of the philosopher's stone. They're standing on the dragon, a fire breathing dragon, and it's a green dragon, which is actually uh, one of the processes in alchemy but it is also a symbol of overcoming their passions. And they stand on a kind of cosmic egg for the universe. They're actually within an egg shape. And you see here the uh, Pythagorean triangle and the quadrangle, the three and the four are very important numbers. And the fact that this cosmic egg has wings makes it also universal. And some of the other symbols of alchemy are there in the illustration as well. So what is this symbolism really about, about the hermaphrodite? It speaks to the unity of the self, as well as the law of duality, which is seen everywhere in nature. 
In alchemy, the king and the queen seek union in one being. The fifth image, that's what this one is, is from Valentine's Azoth from Adam McLean's gallery of alchemical images. So um, Valentine or Valentine, not the one of Valentine's Day. He was uh, a, um, a kind of um, Middle Ages, Renaissance, late Middle Ages, Renaissance um, alchemist who did these drawings. Here's another drawing depicting the alchemical marriage. So what is this search for a soulmate really about? This is also called the divine or inner mystical marriage. It's not an outward one, rather an inward one. So this image depicts the symbolic union of opposites exemplified by the chalice in the middle, the holy grail to be achieved within one's self, a kind of union of all these conflicting, possibly conflicting energies. The bride and bridegroom of the alchemical inner wedding of the soul and the divine are shown here in this painting by alchemist and Rosicrucian Steve Palick. Actual physical marriage is more about the survival of life, that is through the birth of offspring, and traditionally was a contractual agreement. If we look at the history of marriage over centuries of time, it's really about a contract. It's about possessions and property, about dowry and survival as well, because um, both people who engage in that contract not only see to their dynasty, that is to those who follow them, but also to secure property and to make sure that life in humanity survive in the most basic sense. So physical marriage evolved in that way. And even today it is considered a financial contract. You get a tax break, at least you do in Canada, if you're partnered in a marriage. A true spiritual partnership is created, however, when each soul recognizes the autonomy and equality of the other on this life's journey of awakening. Therefore, not, you know, one partner isn't treated as property or as a possession, but as an equal partnership. And it's a spiritual partnership at a higher level. Each commits to the spiritual evolution of the other in that relationship. Spiritual alchemy invites us to realize that we are already complete as a manifestation of the divine. So let's look a little further at this idea. There is a, a lovely article from a Rosicrucian Digest from 1986. It's actually a reprint of a, a much earlier um, discourse written by H. Spencer Lewis. The main title is The Alchemy of Marriage. The subtitle is Opposite Polarities further creation. And in it, he talks about marriage and divorce, very much so on the physical plane. So this paper was written by one of the co-founders of Amorc, the ancient mystical order Rosicrucius. And you see the dates when he was born and his transition was in 1939. And you'll see here the reference on the slide, but you will also see it in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a PDF that you can download so you can then save the resources that we talked about during this presentation. So what does H. Spencer Lewis further have to say about the alchemy of marriage? He speaks of the law of the triangle. One element combines with another to produce a third or creative manifestation. And at, at its most basic level on the physical plane, when we talk about human marriage or a conjoining union, we are talking about furthering life on earth, at least as far as humanity is concerned. However, he also states that we sometimes allow passing emotions and our rational selves to interfere with what constitutes a soul marriage. That is a relationship in which two persons have not only an affinity for each other, but a spiritual connection beyond the physical. And we tend to overthink sometimes in our relationships. We are easily annoyed. 
when someone doesn't exactly conform to our wishes. And over time, as love relationships mature, we tend to have a little bit more tolerance for, and we allow for that equality and autonomy of the other person. And we see lessons within that relationship. And H. Spencer Lewis in this paper does very much emphasize that sometimes separation and divorce are inevitable and necessary because um, the original marriage may have simply been based on an initial attraction, but really there isn't that much commonality. It isn't really a, a soul uh, marriage, even in uh, the sense of two people meeting and coming together over time. So that's the triangle on the spiritual plane. The law of the triangle is taught in the early monographs. It's one of the very early lessons at the very beginning of the studies. And I highly recommend that um, you consider taking up the Rosicrucian studies because I know you would find them if you're not already a member, very enriching. And those of you who are Rosicrucians, you should be going online and looking at your monographs for your lessons. They uh, seem fairly basic at first, but time moves quickly and they pile up over time. Let's look at more con a contemporary way of looking at relationships from Jungian psychology. Although some would say even that is now a little bit passe or outdated, except those who of course are following Jungian psychology uh, after Carl Jung. They, um, this would be considered early and mid 20th century. You'll see on the screen an image of the yin and the yang, the mandala from often attributed to Chinese philosophy and the idea of the seed of the opposite being contained in the other, both light and, ar and dark male and female, night and day, sun and moon. All of these dualities are very apparent to us in often the natural world. And through the centuries, um, people tend to think somehow that maybe that's the only way of looking at things, but that isn't necessarily so. There is a complexity in all of this. And you see here that these two um, almost look like fish are moving, there's a kind of motion involved in that because everything is always in flux and in motion. Through the use of what Carl Jung termed the active imagination, and we have a, a beautiful paper about that um, in the Rosequad Journal, written from the aspect of Jungian uh, psychology that compares it to H. Spencer Lewis's concept of mental creation and visualization. Carl Jung believed that we can visualize ourselves as complex inner beings. We are both personal and impersonal. We are male and female. We are rational and intuitive. We are active and receptive. Jung articulated these aspects within the self or within the psyche which we call the soul personality. And remember, psyche in Greek means mind or soul. He called this the anima, the feminine within the male psyche, and the animus, the masculine aspects within the female psyche. It's a little bit more complex than just that simple duality, however, because today we recognize gender diversity as expressions of the divine soul manifesting itself in multiplicity and diversity, and not simply as a duality of man or woman. So let's look at some of the origins of the idea of the soulmate. And we'll see here the kind of Genesis couple, Adam and Eve, and this wood block print engraving is entitled The Expulsion from Eden. It was made by Pissant, a French Victorian. And it is also, um, he lived during the Romantic era, both you know, in art and literature. The 19th century, the 1800s were, were very much about romanticism. 
So we see him, them fleeing here from paradise or the garden. Now, if you recall the story from Genesis, Adam wished for companionship. He felt lonely and he asked the divine for a companion. So Eve was created by taking a rib from Adam's side. Now note the symbolism of the equality of the sexes. Eve was not constructed from a bone from his skull to rule over him. She was not taken from a bone in his foot that she should be stepped on by him, but rather as a companion and an equal. Original sin in the biblical narrative is about attaining knowledge. That is the knowledge of duality. We cannot escape it because we live on this material plane. And many of us tend to see that duality, not just as light and dark, but also as good and evil. And certainly in, in the biblical sense. Now, more symbolically and metaphorically, if we treat the Bible as literature, and we understand its symbolism that this also, this expulsion represents the fall from innocence into experience. As we grow and mature and experience teaches us hard lessons, there's suffering and often suffering is our greatest teacher. So this biblical story is also has psychological relevance. You see the angel here with the sword and the light behind her. She is pointing the way into the world and everyone must navigate their own journey in that world. It helps to have a companion because maybe life lessons are more easily learned with someone at our side, but not always necessarily. This angel represents our separation, our sense of separation from divinity. And Eden in Hebrew, means bliss or happiness. And sometimes we do get caught up in our own suffering, especially on days like today. Now let's look at the Hermetic origins. In the ancient mystical literature of Hermes Trismegistus, which means thrice great Hermes, he's three times great. He is uh, considered a kind of mythological figure, hence Hermetic comes from the word for name Hermes. Hermetic also means on one level secret. So the secret teachings of three times great Hermes, the first book in this collection of Hermetic documents was the Pomandres. And in the Pomandres, um, the author who we'll say is Hermes, but you know, he is a mythological figure often associated with the Egyptian god Toth, the god of writing and literature and knowledge. Um, the Pomandres is really about the concept of the soul's fall from perfection into matter. And this fall from perfection is depicted as the loss of our intimate connection with divinity. In this story, in the Pomandres of the soul's descent into matter, the soul picks up gross matter as it descends through seven spheres and thus is ever seeking reunification with the divine mind or divine soul. And this return to paradise is mirrored in the celestial ascent of meditation. In Martinism, a sister organization of the Rosicrucian order, the concept of reintegration informs the Martinist quest for reunion with omneity, with the divine. And the metaphor that's often used is of being lost in the forest of errors. And often life may seem like that, very confusing. And we sometimes do feel lost and wonder, you know, what is our purpose? What are we really doing here? And if love is really the underlying purpose, what is my role in all of this? And I want you to think about these questions for yourself. This has been a question that humanity has faced over millennia of time. So here we have another interesting uh, photograph. It's from, and you will recognize this from outside of a medieval cathedral many of the great cathedrals in Europe. 
were built during the early through to the late Middle Ages. It took sometimes over a century to construct a cathedral, perhaps not even one generation, um, but several engaged in the work of building these, these amazing monuments and sacred buildings. What do you think is being depicted here? Well, we have what look like monks holding a key and we see some kind of demonic figure with wings falling. So this is both hermetic, but it's also in the Western spiritual tradition. This is Lucifer or Satan's fall from heaven. And again, from much of the literature that you would be aware that this is due to pride. The symbolism here suggests that hell is a state of mind that we are conscious of our soul personalities imperfections and our sense of separation from divine unity. Studying mysticism and studying spiritual texts, contemplation and meditation is very much about seeking that reunification and finding our way through that forest of errors. So what are the origins of Valentine's Day? And I know you would find this um, a little bit interesting here. Valentine may have been a third century Christian who was imprisoned and then later executed. The origins of the February 14th celebration are murky at best, but they coincide with the death or what we say in the order as transition of Valentine. There were at least three men named Valentinus or Valentine, all martyrs, two of whom were killed by Roman Emperor Claudius for defying decrees. One Valentine for marrying couples in secret. Soldiers under Claudius couldn't marry, and so Valentine did that, or Valentinus did that, and was obviously executed. So it, that day is supposed to coincide with the execution of Valentine. Valentinus is said to have given the first Valentine to a young woman who frequently visited him in his cell. That was the jailer's daughter. His note to her said, from your Valentine. And that's of course a rather uh, mythic beginning of this holiday. There are further Roman origins of Valentine's Day, and some of you will recognize this famous statue because it has to do with the founding of Rome. So the actual origin is a Roman festival. It was a fertility cult celebrated on February the 15th, or perhaps the 13th, the Ides, called Lupercalia. And that's from the sixth century before the Common Era, that honors the she-wolf who mothered Romulus and Remus, or Remus. She did not give birth to the twins. She helped them to survive. So this myth is part of the story of the founding of Rome in 753 BCE. Part of the story is that their mother, Rhea Silvia, was a Vestal Virgin, whose life and the life of her twins was spared by the king, happened to also be her uncle. He had forced her into service as a Vestal while banishing her infant sons. Now, this is, of course, there's irony in this because Vestal virgins were not allowed to marry or to seek the companion um, of a male. They had their own um, place. It was a large complex in the center of Rome. And this is a photograph that I took from a visit to that particular enclosed garden. And it is indeed very beautiful. There are pools of water. There are statues, some of them now, of course, because they're centuries, centuries old, have, um, you know, obviously you see them here in ruins, but this garden has traditionally held pink roses from its beginnings. The Vestals were keepers of the flame. That flame was never to go out. They were considered the heart of Rome and they exemplified the virtue of conscience, of 
um, innocence and of purity. So the question arises, do soulmates exist? We're now at the midpoint of the presentation. It is a romantic ideal. We consider that people will share fireworks as in love at first sight and many uh, modern films and television productions and media tend to um, emphasize that idea. You're not going to like this answer because it's yes and no. Many believe that there's one true life's partner who is meant to be with us. We might not meet in this lifetime. On the other hand, if we are assuming there's only one person who is meant for us alone, then this belief could cause us much grief. Why is that? Well, let's discuss this particular problem. Is it real love or just infatuation? Here's another question. You meet someone new. This person seems so attractive, so much more interesting than your current partner or spouse. What should you do? Is this new person your long-awaited soulmate? Of course, a true soulmate relationship is reciprocal and not just a fleeting infatuation. This brings us to the concept of the ladder of love and this beautiful painting by Josef Simler, again from the Romantic tradition, is of Diotima. And Hugh McCaig in his presentations has spoken to you of the ladder of love that comes from Plato's symposium. And I just want to go over it briefly here because I know Hugh has talked about it in previous presentations and will likely do so again very soon. So Plato in his symposium conceives of love as having various manifestations. And these ascend like rungs in a ladder from the lowest to the highest. Diotima's ladder is about contemplating beauty. And we start at the lowest rung. We contemplate beauty in one person. We then ascend to beauty in others, to the arts, to the sciences, to ideas, especially transcendental ideas, and then to the ultimate form of the divine. Note that beauty of the soul outweighs the beauty of the body as we ascend the ladder of love. Infatuation begins at the lowest rung. We are enchanted often by the physical, which is usually the first step toward our ascent to understanding and contemplating divine love. The next question arises, is it fate? First, such a belief means that the events of our lives are predetermined, they're predestined, and not necessarily created by choice. Now, we all know that there's a lot that happens that is beyond our control. There are things that happen that we don't choose to have happen. However, we always have a choice, ultimately, in how we respond to those circumstances around us. So what some call fate may simply be the result of random chance or perhaps the fulfillment of natural laws like a storm at sea. Others intuit that some relationships are due to karmic necessity. That is, we enter into relationships with others because we have something to learn from that encounter a life lesson that cannot be taught otherwise. The operative word in Rosicrucianism is mastery, self-mastery, and that is probably our most important booklet. It's called The Mastery of Life. It is every seeker's introduction to the Rosicrucian order. And again, we will post that in the chat. And it will, um, that link through the main Rosicrucian website is available to you. And you'll see exactly what our organization has to offer in terms of self-study, but also in its um, relationship with other people, like the webinar that we're having today. 
So through self-mastery, which is everybody's purpose in a way, is to develop that during their lifetime. We aim for that. Thus, we learn how to master not only ourselves, but also our life's circumstances to a certain degree. And if we fail, we pick ourselves up and we try again. Nobody's perfect. We're all human. And we have to give ourselves a break sometimes in understanding that. And we try again. If we make a mistake or we offend, we apologize. This is a, an amazing painting um, by Ivan Kostantinovich. Um, and it's from 1899, again, toward the close of the Romantic era, just at the turn of the 20th century. It's called Gathering Storm. Some believe that we're simply tossed about by chance, like a ship on a roiling sea. However, no matter what life offers us, through self-mastery, we gain confidence in ourselves. Even if we happen to be the passengers or the crew or the captain on that boat, we are the master of our emotions and of to our circumstances to some degree, certainly in our responses. So here's a lovely illustration. It's um, in uh, the Creative Commons. It is Smog and his Horde from Tolkien's The Hobbit. And I found it on the site for the Smithsonian Magazine, although you can find it in other places. This is the year of the dragon. The Lunar New Year 2024 fell on February 10th, it's past Saturday. And it's the year of the wood dragon according to the Chinese calendar. What does that mean for you? Is it your year to strike? Even if you are not a dragon, perhaps you're a monkey or you're a dog or a horse like myself. The dragon represents power, protection and success. Those are its positive attributes. It also represents prosperity. See here it's symbolized by the pile of gold. That uh, is the horde, the dragon. But on its negative side, does anyone really welcome unwanted attention or aggression? If we keep pressing ourselves onto someone who we think should be our soulmate, doesn't happen to agree, then you know we maybe need to take a second look at what we're doing and step back. Consider past choices in the realm of relationships, where your choice is based on false assumptions about the other person. Remember that all experiences are opportunities for higher awareness and growth. One of the ways that we set ourselves up for failure is through fear. And this is connected to having too literal a belief in a destined soulmate because we fear being alone. This real fear, and it has real substance for many, it's based on insecurity. We fear the unknown, and it's a survival fear. We fear loss, while at the same time seeking constant approval and recognition from outside ourselves. This is a painting, again, from the Romantic tradition called Meditation, a woman looking out of a window. And if you were in London, England, it's at the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's a rather somber painting as the woman gazes outside. And depending on your own emotions, you can project emotions onto that image. Is she happy within herself? Or does this picture look sad to you? This identification of ourselves with the objects of desire sets us up, uh, us up for failure. It overlooks our true or higher self, the one who is already complete. Another problem with too literal an idea in soulmates is that we're never satisfied with real people who have real flaws, including ourselves. The emphasis on youth and beauty in our culture is partly based on this ideal of the perfect person. 
The soulmate myth suggests they don't exist. The idea of romantic love or the Romeo and Juliet star-crossed lover's ideal can create much grief. We might overlook persons who can make wonderful mates in favor of chasing a dream or mourning a loss. Some people are in love with being in love and not with the other person. This feeling is like a drug and we seek to recreate it often with someone new. The soulmate myth says there isn't just one. Not all relationships are harmonious. Let's take a moment right now to create a sense of inner calm by first gazing at the painting. Some of you will recognize that it is the current cover of the Rose Qua Journal. Volume 17, we're very close to um, publication of the next volume, 18. This is a beautiful painting from 1908 by John William Waterhouse called The Soul of the Rose. Close your eyes and focus your breath. Focus on your breath by relaxing more deeply with each exhalation. Feel your inner self radiating peace. Visualize yourself inhaling the fragrance of a beautiful rose. Feel the touch of its soft petals against your face. Inhale its sweet aroma. Now radiate this sense of beauty and peace from yourself to others. There are others in the world who may be feeling some upset, distress, worry, illness. Or pain. Radiate this sense of beauty, peace, and harmony. Feel it enveloping the planet. So mote be. So now, Frauders and Sorors friends, back to the concept of the ideal soulmate. Many of our romantic fantasies about true love are based on Hollywood cinema and books like The Princess Bride made into a movie in 1987. Some of you will remember this film if you are old enough, and some of you will remember seeing it maybe with offspring, your children or relatives. However, a more realistic depiction of true love is detailed in the British drama, Brief Encounter, directed by David Lean in 1945. It tells the story of a bored housewife who meets a virtuous married physician by chance. They share tea while waiting for the train and each discovers that the other is not just a possible friend, but what we would describe as a soulmate. Regardless, in the end, each returns to his or her spouse and family. And it is implied that this sacrifice takes place due to loyalty as well as to the impossibility of their relationship. Another film that I invite you to see at some point, if you, and some of you will have seen this and know it quite well, The Philadelphia Story, directed by George Cooper from 1940 with Katherine Hepburn. She's lying here in the laps of three men. Cary Grant plays her divorced husband, 
James Stewart, a, um, a, a want to be writer and journalist who has come to write up the story of her high society pending wedding to John Howard's character who's on the end. It's a romantic comedy that depicts confused love relationships. And it really is a kind of um, a metaphor for or mirror of what goes on sometimes in our own lives. And it's particularly amusing, but it's also quite informative. The Catherine Hepburn character goes back to Cary Grant, her original partner, as she comes to realize the kind of soul connection that they had to begin with. Although their relationship is often filled with conflict and it's stormy, she understands and through a certain kind of mature perspective that he is the love that she is seeking in her life. Now, if we were to make a list of the characteristics of the perfect soulmate, we might have a list that looks something like this. It's not about looks, but rather kindness toward people and animals, all creatures big and small. Affection that is warm, sincere, and shared. Charm, wit, and a sense of humor. Intelligence, which means the ability to think for oneself, along with some shared interests. Trust, allowing those closest to pursue their own interests, not being bossy or overbearing. Decency, grounded in self-worth and the desire to improve and evolve, which means not being overly pious, restrictive, or its opposite to libertine. Grounded in one's spiritual nature, the true self, and not in possessions or objects. Well, who is that perfect soulmate? You guessed it. You are. So how can soulmates be real? Real people can love maturely and profoundly with integrity and have a true spiritual life's partner. If you remain open instead of walking into a false ideal, you can be free to have a better, healthier future relationship with someone who is important to you. And that doesn't necessarily mean marriage. It can mean friendship. It can mean that there's some other person who may be genetically related to you that is important in your life. This can be an elder or even a child. A relationship is based on genuine trust, mutual respect, a complementary understanding of each other and love rather than on a fear of loss, of losing your one and only representation of a soulmate in this life. The ideal soulmate is really oneself, and thus we look for our mirror in the other. We see our best selves in the other person whom we love. So how do I find my soulmate? We need to be intuitively open to possibilities and not close ourselves off. Negative self-talk, like saying, oh, I'll never find someone, or, oh, I'm so jealous because they found someone, but here I am eating alone again. No, that kind of self-talk isn't helpful. We might instantly recognize that the other person has something of value to teach us, but we also have a choice. We can choose to accept that lesson or not. We may find some attraction, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to pursue that relationship. So before we visualize our soulmate, we need to honestly determine the difference between fantasy and reality. In making your own list, and you might want to do that right now, if you have a piece of paper or a pen handy, or just mentally, Make a realistic list of the traits you would prefer in the person whom you wish to attract into your life. And please try not to start with lots of money or good looks. Although I know those things are helpful, but you no, know, realistically, where do we start? 
what would make you happy? What do you have to offer in that relationship? So while you're doing that, I'll just keep talking here because I know you can listen to the sound of my voice and also make a list if you're into that. The law of attraction can work for you, including the technique of visualization. Natural law is really about how the unmanifest becomes the manifested world. And it's a lot easier than you think. It's a law. It's a cosmic law. And it does work. Cosmic laws are fundamental natural laws that govern the universe, and they're available to everyone. So not everybody understands or knows how to apply them. The law of attraction has a precise method or set of steps that are easy to follow. Let's say you've already found your soulmate. Even if that's true, these same steps work to manifest any intention. I know I use the word desire here, and I do want to make a difference or a distinction between desire and intention. There is a distinction. Desire is often formulated as what we think we want or should have, or wish we had. It tends to be based on objective reference rather than referral to our inner self, the inner master, the voice of conscience, the voice of intuition, our higher self, the divine within, in other words. Allow that to guide you instead of feeling like, well, what do I, what do I think I want? What should I have? What I wish, wish do I have? know what I mean? You have to turn within and ask the question. The answer will come. Intention is focused awareness on what is best for us and others in any given moment. The unmanifest responds to intention over desire. Intention is focused awareness what's best for us, but also for others. The recognition that we are beyond desire, beyond our actions, and more than our memories, allows us to experience the quantum field of creative manifestation to create our intention. This recognition is best garnered through the experience of silence, through meditation, on contemplation of beauty and gratitude, on joy and happiness, to shift our focus away from lack, loss, or poverty consciousness. The first step is concentration. I'm going to go through these step-by-step step fairly quickly, but remember this presentation is recorded. You can watch it anytime. You can fast forward through it when it's on YouTube, and you can also um, skip parts of it and get to the parts that you want to review. Beginners learn to enhance mental creation by practicing this important first step. Concentration requires focused attention, but not force. Tuning out extraneous distractions is important. And anyone with uh, intense focus, either reading a book and someone may be asking them a question, so focused on maybe the screen of their cell phone or on a book, they don't hear that other person's voice. When we're driving, we can be very distracted and thinking other thoughts, but still maintain a kind of easy focus on the road ahead and go, oh my goodness, I've just can't even remember the last mile or kilometer that I drove. So we tune out extraneous distractions, but it's easy. It's an easy kind of focus because we also accept whatever arises in our environment, in our circumstances, and in our thoughts. Concentration allows us to effortlessly enter the silence to connect with that which is greater than ourselves. The easiest method is simply to close our eyes and focus on our breath. 
relaxing deeply with each exhalation. Once you're relaxed, you will need to clearly picture your goal in your mind's eye. So do that right now. Just close your eyes. And with each exhalation, relax more deeply by taking a deeper seat within yourself. Create a full sensory image. Include sight, sound, and other senses if applicable. Sense the essence of what you wish to create. See yourself as part of the completed image, perhaps enjoying the companionship of a loved one. See yourself happy and fulfilled. If your visualization includes another person, perhaps feel the touch of a warm hand, a feeling of fullness in your heart center. When the image is complete, hold it. Now release the mental picture into the cosmic mind. Know that it already exists in divine consciousness. Now continue to luxuriate in the silence of being, just existing, just breathing. Simply let go and know that cosmic law fulfills. You may end this visualization with an affirmation. This or something better now manifests for me if it be the will of the cosmic. This or something better now manifests for me if it be the will of the cosmic. So mote it be. Now you may open your eyes and remember it's the subconscious mind, our inner self, the divine within that assists us by way of intuition to follow up on opportunities that arise. Be alert to those promptings of the inner voice, the master within, our link to the cosmic mind. So mote it be. Thank you again for being here today. It's been a pleasure to be with you, everyone. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And I will say farewell and peace profound. <laughs>